Please open your Bibles with me as we will turn to the New Testament, to the letters of John. I would like to read with you from 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Let us hear God's holy and precious word. 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He, that is Christ, is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. Whoever abides in Him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen Him nor known Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as He is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. <clears throat> Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should Believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. Our text is to be found here in this passage. 1 John chapter 3, and then verse 3 in particular. <clears throat> 1 John 3 and verse 3. And everyone 
who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So far then, the reading of God's holy and precious word. And may the Lord help us to understand and respond to it in a positive way. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the world has not much good to say about that one little word, hope. In fact, the world ridicules that whole issue of hope. Let me give you just a few sayings that you hear in this world in respect to hope. Here's one of them. He that lives on hope dies of hunger. Here's another one. Hope and expectation are a fool's income. And here's a quote from the famous philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who in the mid-1800s declared it to the world that God is dead. And here's what he had to say about hope, also very negative. Hope in reality is the worst of all evils because it prolonged the torments of man. That's what the world thinks of hope. Well, now, as you gather from those particular quotes, the world does not put a good place. It does not say good things about hope. But now, what about you and me, as people who have learned the Word of God? What about you and me, who have come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? What about the Christians? What do they think? What do you think about hope? What sort of credit do you, as a Christian, place on hope? Well, before the Christian speaks, let the Bible speak. And I'm going to give you four texts about hope. The first one is Romans 5. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Second one, Titus 2, verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Number three, 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Number four, Hebrews 6, 18 and 19. By two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. So here we have the Bible's testimony of hope. This is a positive way of speaking about hope, isn't it? God's Word, therefore, speaks about hope for several reasons as well. He speaks to us about hope in order to encourage us to know that the Christian life is a good life to live. Remember this, young people. The Christian life is a good life to live. It's a good life to live. The Lord God, the Bible, also speaks to us about hope in order to comfort us when things are difficult in our life. And many of us experience difficulties in life. But the hope will, as it were, Lift us up so that we may trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible also speaks to us about hope in order to excite us, to excite us for what lies in store for you and for me after this life. Because, yes, boys and girls, remember this. There is a life after this life. And for those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a glorious life. It is a wonderful life that will never end and that is what we are and may be excited about. That is what we may hope in as well. But the Bible also speaks to us about hope. For what reason? In order to stir up in us a life of purity and a life of holiness for each one of us. 
<clears throat> it is a very practical aspect, therefore, of the Christian hope. Well, now, this is what our text is all about. 1 John 3 and verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, Christ, is pure. So let us consider those particular words of our text then by the following uh, title and subsections. God's word speaks of hope that purifies. That's our title. God's word speaks of hope that purifies. In the first place, the basis of this hope. Secondly, the operation of this hope. Thirdly, the stimulant of this hope. And then fourthly, the absence of this hope. Now, congregation, the three letters of the Apostle John are full of love. Love towards Christ in the first place, but also love towards the brothers and sisters. But full of love of God towards us. And we cannot forget John's famous words, we love him, why? Because he first loved us. And we need to remember that. We loved him because he first loved us. Well now, in God's love for us, he, God, has given us something that the world does not understand, that the world has in fact totally misinterpreted, namely the word hope. The Apostle Paul speaks of that in 1 Corinthians 13 about faith, hope, and love. All three of are God's gifts, aren't they? Faith, hope, and love. All three are God's gifts. God is the one who gives us faith. God is the one who gives us love. But he is also the one who gives us hope. Hope is therefore God's gift to Christians. And so the question can be asked, dear people, do you have saving faith? Do you have Christian love? If so, you also have that Christian hope, that biblical hope. And if you don't have any of them, you have none of them. But I'll come back to that later on at the end of the sermon. But now, what is the basis of biblical hope, you could ask? Well, let's, let's back up from our text to verse 1. And there it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Now, here is part of the basis of our hope, you see. We are beloved of God. Divine love is therefore the basis of your and my hope. We may have a biblical hope, dear congregation, not because we have been so good and we have been so respectable, we have been so loving, no, but because God is a loving God who gives us that hope. And this truly is an amazing thing, dear people. Here in our text chapter, you can read it and you can sense it as you read John chapter 1, particularly he is overwhelmed, overwhelmed what he is experiencing when he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. In other words, just look at this. Wow, wow. How awesome is the love of the Father towards us. Dr. Beaky Dr. Joel Beakey uh, has written a book on the epistles of John, and I can warmly recommend this book to you. But he says in this book, and I quote, John is astonished because God showed such amazing love, though we were sinners, rebels, and enemies against him and his kingdom. John is astonished at the love of God. Do you ever stand in awe, dear people, of this wonderful love of God the Father? Holy wonder and amazement is an important part of the Christian experience. 
And we are also warned in this book that the devil's tactics is to dull those senses of wonder by any means that he can. And we need to watch out for that, that he doesn't dull those senses of holy excitement in the love of God. Please do not allow the devil to do this to you, but be filled with wonder, be filled with amazement at divine love. God the Father has bestowed his love upon us, and his love is therefore the basis of your and my hope. Dear people, our hope is not based on chance. It is not based on good fortune. It is not based on a maybe, but it is based on the sure love of God. This is why the Apostle Paul could say, for instance, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so the question comes to each one of us, are you acquainted with this divine love of God? If not, my dear friend, you are missing out on so much. But again, I'll say something about that later on, closer to the end of the sermon. But for now, remember this, that the love which God the Father has bestowed on us is a good part of the basis of our hope. Now, what else makes up for the basis of our hope, biblical hope? Well, let's, let's read on. From verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. The basis of our hope is that we are part of the family of God. Remember this? The basis of our hope is not that we are strangers anymore, but we are part of the family. Now, that's more than being a servant of God. It's great to be a servant of God already. It's more, it's more than than being a friend of God. Who wouldn't want to be a friend of God? But it says here, children of God. Children of God. And that is a wonderful privilege that we may enjoy. We are the children of God. To say it more precisely, we are the adopted children of God. And again, the Apostle John is, is overwhelmed with his great truth. And so he continues for us in verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he, that is Christ, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. For John to know that he is a child, an adopted child of God, filled him with such great expectation and hope, of what the future would have in store for him. Do you know, do you know if you are a son or a daughter of God? Do you know if you're a child of God? Or let me ask it in a very basic Puritan question. Are you born again? Do you live, not for yourself, but do you live for God? Well, the privilege of, of knowing that we are the children of God is the basis of your and my Christian hope. And so, let me then summarize my first point. The basis for biblical hope is the love of God that the Father has bestowed on us and the knowledge that we are the children of God. But now, as I must concentrate more closely on our text, speaking of this hope, my second point is to deal with the operation of this hope, the operation of this hope. In other words, we must now answer the question of how this biblical hope operates in your and in my life. And listen again to our text. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, that is Christ, is pure. Our biblical hope, dear people, is linked to a desire for purity, a desire for holiness. 
That is also how it can be translated, purity, holiness. In other words, our biblical hope creates in us a desire to be pure, to live a pure life, to live a holy life, and that, that desire stimulates in us the process for such purity, for such holiness as well. The same thought is expressed by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Therefore, he writes, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness, or you could also say perfecting purity in the fear of God. If you have this biblical hope, you will want to purify yourself. You will want to see yourself be clean. This is how biblical hope operates in your life, you see. It motivates you to purify yourself. Now, how is this done? Allow me to suggest several ways. One, to purify yourself means to put away and be done with all the obviously grosser sins in your life. Filthiness of the flesh is certainly one way of describing the obviously grosser sins of your and of my life. We are told in Colossians 3, for instance, we are told to mortify, that is, we are to put to death our members which are on earth, such as then he gives a whole list, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. And also to put off all of these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, shameful speech out of your mouth. We are to put away all of that. We want to resist all of that and say, no longer will I engage in any of those gross sins. These are Obviously, then, the grosser sins that you and I are to purify and purge ourselves of. Two, there are also the less obvious sins in our life that we are to purify ourselves of. And here, dear people, our conscience can be a great help. Our conscience is like a cork in the water if I may explain it that way. Not like a large cruise ship, but like a cork. A large cruise ship does not yield to every way of the sea, but cuts through the water without the slightest up and down motion. But a cork goes up and down with every ripple tossing and turning at the slightest waves. Now, this, this is how our conscience should also be, sensitive to every ripple of sin, tossing and turning at the slightest wave of temptation that would come at us. Well, you and I should therefore listen to a very sensitive conscience that has been worked in us if we are intent on purifying ourselves. Three. Purifying yourselves means also to distance yourselves from evil company. The Apostle Paul warns for that in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, that evil company ruins good morals. Purifying yourself might mean parting with friends who do not want to be Christian or hear anything about being Christian. It may mean breaking a relationship with someone who has no interest whatsoever in the Lord Jesus Christ or in the teaching of the Bible, then we have to turn away from such a person. Four, purifying yourself means also to place yourself under a heart-searching ministry where the Holy Spirit is given ample opportunity to, as it were, prick your conscience and stir you to a better and a holier life. And we know that for this purifying process, we need the Holy Spirit, don't we? We know also that the Holy Spirit is apt to work how? The most effectively through the Word of God as it is read and as it is preached to us. 
And therefore, dear people, as you are doing it now, expose yourself as much as you can to the penetrating light of the Word and of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Exposing yourself to the light of the Word and the Holy Spirit is much like exposing yourself to radiation treatment. With radiation, the X-ray light penetrates deep inside you, killing off the bad cells. Well, now, the X-ray light of the Holy Spirit and of the Word also penetrates deep inside of our heart to kill off those bad seeds and cells of sin. A heart-searching ministry operated by the Word and Holy Spirit can be a very effectual spiritual radiation treatment, so to speak. This also is one of the several ways that you may purify yourselves. And dear people, our text says that everyone who has this biblical hope in him purifies himself. If you have this biblical hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, it will put you into the process of purifying yourself and puts it into operation in your heart and life. And so the question again can be asked, are you acquainted with this process of purifying yourself? Have you learned to put off those obviously grosser sins in your life? Have you cultivated a sensitive conscience through the word and through the preaching? Are you willing to place yourselves under the heart-searching ministry of the word of God? Do you pray for the Holy Spirit to search you and see if there's any secret sin that keeps inside of you and that you be cleansed of all such sins? And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So says our text. This takes me to my third point. The stimulant of this hope. What is the stimulant of this hope? Who or what stimulizes us to consider this hope that John speaks of? Who is it who excites us to have this hope and to have this hope purifying myself? Who is it? It is Christ. This is what our text refers to when it says, even as he is pure. Now, we know that Christ is pure, that he is holy, perfectly pure, and perfectly holy. Even in his human nature, while he was on earth, he remained pure and holy and without sin. He could therefore be our Savior, after all, because he gave himself as a lamb without blemish, pure and holy, in order to sacrifice himself for the likes of you and me. We're told in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Well, being saved by him, and having our hope in him, he is also our stimulant upon whom we should excite ourselves to become more and more pure and holy, even as he is pure and holy. And dear people, our, our hope is to be perfect someday, isn't it? I trust that that is your hope as well, to be perfect someday. And to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ one day. And then we will be like Christ. As, as much like Christ as is possible by the work of God, the Holy Spirit. If your hope of heaven is to be like Christ, he is to be your stimulant today. He is to be your model today. He is to be your example today. He is the one today to set the example for you. And so you are to look to him at all times as to how he has conducted himself while he is on earth. He is the one that you need to press after, as the Apostle Paul says it. He's the goal of our life. 
a life of purity and holiness. Now, if this is true, if you really want to be like Christ, and if this is your heavenly hope, then purify yourselves and have this purity continue to work out in your life. That the the heavenliness of Christ may become more and more your desire in life. Therefore, as I look at at the purity of Christ, as I look at the holiness of Christ, and I long to be with him in the future, I find my hope stimulated by him to purify myself in the present. If I fix my hope on him, such hope in him itself already becomes purifying in me. You see, you and I, I I cannot study the person of Christ without having a heart that longs for him and to be like him. That's how it should be, you see. I cannot have a passionate longing to be like Christ in the life to come without having it affected me in this life already. And therefore, when you think of heaven, dear people, Fix your hope on him, on Jesus Christ, and see how he will purify your life here. Living in this hope is absolutely life-transforming and life-purifying. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Hope that purifies. Well, we've looked at the basis of this hope. We've looked at the operation of this hope. We've looked at the stimulant of this hope. And now lastly, something about the absence of this hope. Our text speaks of any person that has this hope, <clears throat> which therefore implies that there are some who do not have this hope. I do not know, and I cannot tell if there's anyone listening who does not have this biblical hope. But if there is, I must tell you with much pastoral concern that the hope of this world does not amount to much. It does not amount to anything, really. What it amounts to is that you really have no hope whatsoever then. If you, the Apostle Paul, rather of you, the Apostle Paul would have to say in Ephesians 2 verse 12 that you are without Christ, being aliens of the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. If you want nothing to do with Christ, that is what Paul has to say about you. And so, my dear friend, I do not know how to alarm you, but I know the Holy Spirit can. Your case warrants that alarm to be sounded this hour. Any moment your life could end and you would be without Christ and without God in the next world, eternally separated from any and all love without a hope of ever, ever escaping. And I urge you, I pastorally urge you Do not turn this alarm off as you are hearing it right now, this hour. Do not go back into your everyday life as if you have not heard a thing this morning in church. Get yourself to call God, to call on God for mercy. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to make himself known to you and to show his love to you, a sinner. Pray the Holy Spirit to work saving faith in you, and he can do that so marvelously. Do it while you still have the opportunity to do so, dear friends. Perhaps you do entertain the hope of going to heaven, but there has really been no desire whatsoever to purify yourself you feel rather comfortable in your sin. Perhaps perhaps you are basing your hope on your, your decent life, on your church attendance, on your proper treatment of others. 
Perhaps you're basing your hope on how well you have kept all the commandments of God. My friend, I do not wish to rain upon your parade, but I must tell you, you are entertaining a false hope. A hope of heaven without the desire to be pure and holy like Christ is a hope that will be dashed to pieces when you will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. He will say then to you, your hope was not based on me. Depart from me. I never knew you. May Christ not have to say this to any of you here. Not to any of you here. Today, there is still hope for you. Great hope, in fact. Otherwise, the gospel, as you heard it this morning, would not have been preached to you. Put away of all hopes in yourself. Banish all false hopes and place your hope completely on Jesus Christ. You know, I wish I could do more than just speak this word. I wish that I could persuade you of the greatness and of the excellency of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just one glimpse of his sincere love and sincere personality. It will win you over. He is such a warm, he is such a kind, he is such a loving Savior, dear people. And even now, I can, as it were, hear him say it to you. Come to me, come to me with me. There is true, satisfying, fulfilling hope. Come to me, so says Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters in the faith, your hope is on solid ground. Let your hope stir you to holy activity. Let your hope stimulate you, you to become more and more Christ-like. Let it motivate you to purify yourself even as he is pure. And the day will come that you will be like him. You'll be like him, for you shall see him as he is. It will be hope fulfilled. Amen. Let us ask the Lord to apply the word to our hearts and lives. Let us pray. O Lord God, we have heard your word explained to us. The word is very precise as we could read it. And we know that the love that you have bestowed upon mankind is of such a nature that it does astonish us. Why would you love such sinners like we are by nature? But you are a God of love, and you have instilled by your love a tremendous hope, a hope that the world doesn't know anything of, but a hope that the Bible speaks of so eloquently. We thank you for this. We pray that we may have that hope in Christ and that having this hope, we have a great desire to keep ourselves pure, to live a holy life, to escape from all that is sinful and to put away all that which is not to your honor. We pray help us to worship you Help us to live a life that is filled with hope for that eternal blessedness that lies in store for all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and will one day want to be with him forever. Bless our youth, our young people. Grant that they too may know of that hope and that they may trust Jesus Christ to give them eternal life. Be so with us, we pray. Bless us as we go our homeward way and bring us back again later on this day that we may worship you. Help us as we give our offerings to you and for the service and grant that we may be richly abundant to give our gifts as well. And that in Jesus' name alone. Amen.